This is microeconomics lecture number 14 on the microeconomics of international trade. Let's learn some economics. What we want to do here is we want to provide uh, a discussion, okay? And our focus is on not your standard straightforward international trade argument that you'll find in any economics textbook, but instead the actual microeconomic effects of international trade, which is to say the way that international trade affects the individual players that are in international trade. One of the things I found rather disappointing in the book, uh, although it's not unexpected, uh, is that when McConnell and Brew in their discussion of microeconomics got to international trade, they throw out there just your, your uh, typical international trade argument that you'll find in econ any economics textbook. Uh, instead of doing what we're going to do here, which is focusing on the effects of international trade on a microeconomic level. Now, let's start off with just the basic argument in international trade, the basic idea, the basic principle of how international trade is going to affect an economy. All right. When we start the trade, what is, what is trade going to do? If we allow foreign competition into uh, a particular country, that's going to increase supply, okay? And so we're back to our original discussion of, of supply way from way back in, what, lecture number four. What that's going to do is increase supply. It's going to create a downward pressure on prices. Ultimately, we're going to see that that moves us towards economic efficiency. Why? Because the downward pressure on prices reduces profits, pushes you down the marginal cost curve until eventually you hit minimum marginal cost. And the same thing will be true of average total cost, okay? Now let's take a look at that. There's two different ways we look at, we can look at marginal cost. And again, you're not going to see this in the textbook. Uh, because theirs is just your standard, okay, here's international trade. These are the arguments for international trade. This is why international trade is so wonderful. But on, on a microeconomic level, it's not necessarily wonderful. It helps some and hurts others. Okay. Now first, we look at this situation. Our domestic producer produces it along this marginal cost curve. You can see that it's much higher than the, the foreign marginal cost. Okay? And as a result, when the foreigners, when the foreign company begins to produce in our market, um, they can do so at a much lower price. As the price drops, they continue to make a profit. Uh, but once the price drops below our minimum marginal cost, we operate at a loss, okay? So in this case, foreign competition <coughs> creates a situation where the domestic producer can't match that marginal cost and will be forced to drop out, okay? And so one of the things you notice from this is that not only does it cause the allocative efficiency phenomenon of moving prices towards minimum marginal cost, but it also forces marginal cost down to its minimum level. Eventually, domestic producers will have to match the marginal cost of foreign producers. This is going to be one of the arguments in, in, in the more general macroeconomic discussion or international trade economic, uh, international trade uh, discussions uh, of protectionist trade policies. This is going to be one of the arguments for it is that a low wage country, pauper labor, a low-wage country can produce for a much lower marginal cost, and so they face this marginal cost curve here. Our domestic producers face this marginal cost curve here, uh, and so as a result, our domestic producers can't compete with the foreign producers. What you want to do in that case is put a tax on the product on an individual basis, individual unit tax, a tariff on the product. That will force their marginal cost curve up, okay? That's the argument that's usually made uh, by those who argue for protectionism, tariffs, uh, against, for example, manufactured products from China. Another way of looking at it and is uh, this way. Okay. Now here, the explanation behind this is both the domestic producer and the foreign producer are in the process of developing an economy of scale. If you can remember, we discussed the idea of an economy of scale back when we introduced the idea of marginal cost, back in, I think it was lecture seven, when we were dealing with the production function. Okay, we start off with the highest marginal cost as we specialize in function. We begin to see 
lower and lower marginal costs till we get to some minimum point, which we call the point of capital saturation, after which marginal cost starts to rise again, and then we set our price where price equals marginal cost over here somewhere, okay? Well, in this situation, both domestic and foreign producers are in the process of developing an economy of scale. Okay, this would be, for example, this would be a situation that would be faced, for example, by the United States in the late 18th and early 19th century in the textile industry. Okay, American textiles were just starting out, and so they faced a very high marginal cost. British textiles had been being produced for over 150 years. They'd gone through the Industrial Revolution and were much lower on the marginal cost curve. And so they had a competitive advantage against U.S. products, meaning they could charge a lower price. Uh, and just kind of a lesson from history here, uh, that all came kind of crashing to an end when Jefferson imposed uh, the Embargo Act uh, and, and then the, the Non-Intercourse Act in 1807 and 1809, respectively, which prohibited British goods from coming into the United States. Uh, now here, again, what we can do is if we can if we can uh, tariff the product or in some way limit it coming into the country, it will force them back up the marginal cost curve. It will cost them more per unit, that more per unit being the amount of the tax, uh, and force them back up uh, and allow our producers to experience a profit. Because here what happens is here's, here's the domestic producers. Originally the price is here. Uh, our domestic producers are producing here and experiencing this level of profit, okay? Eventually, they'll come down and, and set a price somewhere around here. Uh, as they come down here, the price from domestic competition will start to come down. But when the foreigners come in and begin producing or begin selling in our market, the price immediately drops down here. Uh, and so our domestic producers now operate at a loss. If we can bring that price back up temporarily through a tariff or through some other uh, uh, restriction of, of trade, uh, it will allow our domestic producers time to develop uh, a, a lower marginal cost. This is what's referred to as the infant industry argument in general terms, in international trade terms, okay? Uh, but that's the second way of looking at the effect on marginal cost of international trade. Here we see the firms that are involved in international trade. Everything we've talked about so far is for domestic producers. Okay, Domestic producers, when facing foreign competition, uh, are in the boat that we've been talking about for the lecture. Okay, So domestic producers never like foreign competition. Why? Because the foreign competition uh, forces the supply curve outward, forces prices down, forces, as a result of forcing prices down, it forces... Uh, 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 profits down, ultimately moving towards allocative inefficiency, which is why in the short run, uh, profits will evaporate. Okay, It should also be noted that as a result of the foreign competition, as that price drops down, as we've seen before in profit maximization discussions and in the profit maximization lecture, when it forces the price down, it's going to move the profit maximizing level of output uh, down in terms of production levels. Okay, we, we saw that before uh, in our profit maximization lecture, uh, and so it's going to have a generally negative effect on employment levels in the domestic market. Okay, now importers, they're simply middlemen. Importers don't actually produce anything. What they do is they buy foreign goods, bring them over, uh, and then sell them in the domestic market. Okay, uh, so they're basically capitalists. They're just simply middlemen. Exporters are a little bit different. Exporters do actually produce something, and exporters will experience a positive effect from trade generally because they'll end up selling in the foreign market. We'll look at that in the next slide a little bit, and it's fairly basic. It's, 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 it's exactly the same graphic we looked at before, uh, except now what we talked about previously was what's going to happen to our domestic producer when foreign producers come in. Well, for our exporters, our exporters are those foreign producers that come in. And so their production levels will go up as a result of their production levels going up. Uh, uh, the demand for labor is going to go up, etc. Okay, in their home markets. And then finally, we have that most interesting of all beasts, the multinational corporation. Multinational corporations 
are headquartered in one country and have productive facilities in other countries. And the question, of course, is why would somebody do that? Why would you go overseas and produce overseas? There are a number of arguments that we'll look at for why that is. Again, here is this, this discussion of the exporters. This time, this is exactly the same graphic we looked at uh, from the first slide, right? This is the same graphic, only this time we interpret it a little bit differently. Here we have a particular firm, okay, that produces in the domestic market. And here's demand for their goods in the domestic market, okay? Well, here's the supply they increase. This is their domestic supply plus their foreign sales. That slides their supply curve outward. It increases their production level, okay? Because it increases their production level, it increases the demand for labor, and generally on a macroeconomic level has a positive effect uh, on employment in their home country. So U.S. exporters create a positive effect on employment levels in the United States. And we'll look at what's going to affect that, uh, exporters and importers, in just a second. The number one thing that's going to affect us, and what we really want to kind of focus our attention on for a little while, is the idea of currency exchange, the currency exchange basics. Now, we understand, first off, that currency is like any other commodity. Okay, and we're now bringing to bear, in lect we're now in Lecture 14, and we're bringing to bear everything we've learned previously. Okay? Okay. Uh, all of the principles we've looked at of microeconomics so far are going to be the same with currency exchange. Currency is like any other commodity. What determines the value of it is the supply of it and the demand for it. Okay, we'll then look at what determines the supply of it and what determines the demand for it. Well, one of the determinants of demand for a currency is predicated on this assumption. We are predicating this on the assumption that an exporter, okay, someone that is producing in the domestic market and selling overseas, wants to be paid in their home currency. So U.S. exporters want to be paid in U.S. dollars. European exporters want to be paid in euros, okay, if they're in the eurozone. Chinese exporters want to be paid in yuan. That's not universally true, okay? After all, you can be paid in whatever currency you want. And, and so, for example, in the petroleum industry, the petroleum market, international oil, is all bought and sold in dollars, okay? We won't get into those nuances. That's more for a discussion, a more general discussion of international trade and currency exchange. We're interested in here in focusing our attention in on the microeconomic effects of currency exchange, okay? And so for an importer to purchase foreign products, they first have to go to the bank and exchange their domestic currency for foreign currency. So a U.S. importer that's buying European goods first has to go down to the bank and exchange U.S. dollars for euros. Simple enough? Now we want to look at two things, depreciation and appreciation, and see what they do. Depreciation is a drop in the currency's value vis-a-vis -vis or versus other currencies. Appreciation in value is an increase in the currency value vis-a-vis -vis or versus other currencies. Okay? Now, let's, let's start with those basics and move forward. As a result of what we've said, it's really not entirely accurate to talk about something like the U.S. dollar appreciating in value. All currencies have a bilateral relationship, and the relationship is inverse, okay? And we'll look at that in just a second. We're going to take this step by step because currency exchange can, unless we're careful, become kind of confusing. But really, it's not confusing. It's very simple to understand when we, when we base it on this idea. You have a bilateral relationship. So we can't really talk about the U.S. dollar or the euro or the yuan appreciating in value. We talk about it appreciating in value versus another currency. So we can talk about the U.S. dollar appreciating in value against the euro or depreciating in value against the euro. All right, so it's a bilateral relationship, and it's an inverse relationship. Now, let's start off simply. 
And we're going to start off with the extra ab abstract. I haven't talked about these guys in a long time. I used to bring these guys into uh, international trade and finance when I taught international trade and finance uh, way back when. We'd have we'd have all, all hosts of these. We'd have all the way down to Epsilon and things like that. But, okay, we have Alphas and Betas, the Alphans and the Betans. Whenever I think of the Alphans and the, whenever I think of this, I'm always, I'm always, I, I always look to, to like a journey through the side of the earth where you have a, the, the Eloi and the, and the Morlocks. Okay. But that's not fair. That, that would put the Betas kind of as the Morlocks and they're not. Betas are very nice people. Uh, okay. But at any rate, no, nice fish too. Uh, no, they're, actually they're not fish. Betas are not nice fish. Betas are very mean fish. Um, but at any rate, okay. So you have Alphas and Betas. Okay. Uh, now. We start off, simply enough, with one alpha equals one beta. All right? So, for example, if you have an alpha and importer, for them to purchase a product from beta, they have to go down to the bank and exchange one alpha and get one beta. Okay? For every beta's worth of goods they buy from beta. Okay? We can, of course, always, and I'm not going to do this very often because I, I chose to use alpha and beta so, so that I could, actually because it was easier to access those symbols than it was the symbols for currency is actually why I chose them. Uh, but at any rate, um, you can have euros in U.S. dollars. Okay, same basic idea. And in fact, when the euro was first introduced internationally in 1999, one euro was equal to one U.S. dollar. That was what they set the value at. Uh, but at any rate, okay, so one alpha and one beta. For every alpha, and the the alpha and importer comes, takes down to the bank, he'll get one beta. S okay, simple enough. So far, so far, so good. Now let's look at how the currencies are going to uh, uh, fluctuate. Let's look first at the alpha appreciating in value. Let's say the alpha appreciates in value. It gets more valuable vis-a-vis -vis the beta by, say, 10%. Okay? So that now, instead of one alpha buying one beta, one alpha buys 1.1 betas. They get more per alpha. First of all, remember I mentioned it's, a, it's an inverse relationship. It's always bilateral. And it is, they are inverses of each other. If, if alpha is now more valuable vis-a-vis -vis beta, does it not then stand logically that betas are less valuable vis-a-vis -vis alphas? And so if one currency is appreciating versus another, the other currency is depreciating. If U.S. dollars are appreciating against the euro, the euro is depreciating against the dollar. With me so far, okay? So that the same one alpha will now buy 1.1 betas, and a beta will now buy only 0.91. And actually, as it works out, that's rounding. It actually works out to be 0.909090, etc., etc. I've rounded it here to 0.91 alphas. Uh, this, basically, the effect that this is going to have, and this is what we're interested in, is the microeconomic effect of this. This increases the purchasing power of the alpha. So alpha and importers are now going to get more product for the same amount of money. This is going to increase their profits ultimately, which is what we'll see. Okay, so our alphans are now going to get more for every alpha that they exchange. They're going to get more betas for every alpha that they exchange, and it is going to decrease the purchasing power of the beta. So beta importers will be hurt by this. Okay, and we want to keep this in mind too, and I'll mention it again later. Okay, there's an inverse to this as well. Importers and exporters have an inverse relationship. So an appreciation of our currency helps our importers because it makes foreign products relatively cheaper. They get more bang for their buck. Okay, when our currency appreciates in value, when the alpha appreciates in value, they get more, the alpha and importers get more betas. They get a bigger bang for their buck. Okay? Well, so too, the exact opposite happens for our exporters. When, when the alpha appreciates in value, the beta importers who are buying alpha products now have to pay more for the same amount. Okay? And we'll look at that in a minute. Now, uh, now okay. So far, so good. We're paying attention to this. All right. Now we look at this example. 
Say the alpha importer wants to buy a product worth 100 betas. Originally, the 100 beta product cost 100 alphas. But with the 10% appreciation of alpha, now each beta to buy the product costs only 0.91 alphas. So the 100 beta product now only costs 91 alphas. Effectively, the appreciation in the alpha causes the price of beta's products to drop. This now gives us an idea of what's going to happen. Okay, so the appreciation in the alpha, the appreciation in the U.S. dollar makes imports cheaper. All right. As a result of it making imports cheaper, people are going to buy more imports. All right. We kind of understand this a little bit. One of the one of the things that's an extension of this whole international trade is if you've ever gone overseas. Okay, you, you, you may never have paid attention at all to anything to do with currency exchange until you do a study abroad or you go overseas. Then all of a sudden currency exchange becomes important for you because when you go to a foreign country, okay, the first thing you have to do if you want to buy anything when you're over there, you have to exchange U.S. dollars for it. And so, yes, if the U.S. dollar appreciates in value, everything in that foreign country is going to be cheaper now because you're going to get more f units of foreign currency for each dollar. If the dollar depreciates in value, then your trip abroad is going to be more expensive. Same basic idea. And this again just reiterates what I've said before. It has the inverse effect. Okay, And so I mentioned before, what's going to happen is, as the alpha appreciates in value, our alpha and importers get more betas for each alpha that they exchange. They get a bigger bang for their buck. They get more product for the same amount of money. Okay, this has the effect of betas products dropping in price. The exact opposite is going to happen to alpha exporters. Okay, because of the appreciation of the alpha, the beta has depreciated, meaning that for beta importers, alpha products are now relatively more expensive, and we see that here. Okay, it has the inverse effect. So it now takes, if, if, if we started out with a Baton importer, alpha and exporter, buying 100, a, a, a Baton importer buying 100 alphas worth, it would be 100 betas for the 100 alphas. That's not going to be the case anymore because the beta has depreciated in value. Because the beta has depreciated in value, Bait and exporters are doing much better. They're selling more in alphas markets, but betas importers aren't doing as well because now it's going to cost 110 betas for the product that used to cost 100 betas. Okay, follow that through a couple of times, and 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 you'll understand what we mean by this inverse relationship. Anything that helps the importers, such as an appreciation in our domestic currency, is going to hurt our exporters and vice versa. Now let's look at what this is going to do on a more macroeconomic level. Okay? The beta producer with the exchange is going to get the same price for their product. Okay? In other words, yes, that's right. The 100 beta product now only costs, what was it, 91 alphas. But the Baden producer is still getting the 100 betas. Now, in the domestic market, it's going to have the net effect of dropping the price of betas. Okay, this is the depreciation of the beta, which means, conversely, the appreciation of the alpha, which is what we've been looking at all along. Okay, that slides you down the demand curve for betas products. This allows, eventually, betas exporters to soak up that increased demand, okay, uh, at the lower price. And that's why, for example, if their currency depreciates, demand for their products will increase, and if their currency appreciates, demand for their products will decrease. And actually, just kind of, not really as an aside, but more on the macroeconomic level, beginning really in the middle of the first Bush administration, Bush 43, okay, so 2002, 2003, uh, and certainly into the second Bush administration, 
the Europeans and the United States got into a minor dispute over currency exchange because as the Bush administration continued to spend money and drive up deficits and therefore borrow money and the Fed to try to keep up pace with this increased the supply of U.S. dollars, it dropped the value of the U.S. dollar and so the U.S. dollar went on a slide in depreciating against the euro, the euro, which made European goods more expensive. And as a result, the demand for European goods in the United States started to drop, and all of the U.S., the, the European exporting firms suffered as a result of this, okay? They suffered a diminution in demand for their products. Uh, and it's kind of interesting that it was a few years later after this that the European debt crisis hit. Okay, but that's a little beyond our scope. Remember, we're focusing only on the microeconomic level. here. Now, let's continue with our example. The alpha importer buys beta products and sells them in alpha's market. If they buy 1 million beta in products, when the alpha is 1.1 1 .1 or, or 1 to 1, this will cost them a million alphas. If they wait until the alpha appreciates, this 1 million beta in products will only cost 909,090.91 alphas, a savings of 90,000 alphas, okay? If instead the alpha depreciates in value, say by 10%, the 1 million beta in products will now cost them 1.1 million alphas. Now you see the significance of this. And in fact, I had a friend. Uh, I know, it's hard to imagine that I had a friend. You would have thought, my incessant discussion of economics would have driven them away, but they were an economist too, so they rather liked my discussion of economics. Meh. Uh, but at any rate, um, what his job was, was he spent all of his time at a bank, okay, in the back of the bank, in a, in a, in a computer room. And who he worked for, he worked for a firm that imported specifically from Japan. And so what he did was trend analysis. He watched the trend in the fluctuating value of the yen versus the U.S. dollar. Because his firm wants to buy Japanese goods when the dollar peaks out in its appreciation against the yen. Okay? And if he blows it, it could cost the firm millions of dollars. Okay, so he has to he had to be really good and really understand currency exchange and what causes the fluctuation in currencies and pay very close attention to things. Okay, so one of the things he would pay close attention to were announcements and reports from the Central Bank of Japan. Okay, uh, 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 because if the Central Bank of Japan announced that they were planning on lowering interest rates, that means you're going to have an increase in supply of yen. And what happens when you increase the supply of something? It has a downward pressure on the price of it, which means the yen could start to depreciate, okay? Which means the dollar will appreciate and Japanese goods will be cheaper. So too, what if the Central Bank of Japan announces that they're going to start increasing interest rates, okay? Because there's inflationary pressures in the Japanese economy. Then he's in trouble then you want to buy before that interest rate increase, okay? And that's why this kind of follows on that discussion, we, we that brief discussion we had on finance, okay? So it becomes everything when you buy. And one of the things we look at in international trade and finance is there are a number of different markets where importers can buy foreign currencies. You can buy them on the spot market. If you go overseas, Okay, and you go study abroad, you go on a trip overseas, and you exchange U.S. dollars for the domestic currency so that you can buy stuff while you're over there. That's what's called the spot market. Typically, that's your worst exchange rate. There is also the futures market, where you can make an agreement to buy them 30 days from now, 90 days from now, okay, 60 days from now. There is also the options market where you can, for a small fee, you have an option to buy them 30 days from now, 90 days from now. You can let that option go and not buy them, 
okay? And so that's at the level of international trade and finance. That's beyond our scope here. But just to give you an idea of, of how that exists and how significant it is at a microeconomic level, that, that's where it is. And so, uh, or that, you know, that shows you the how, how currency exchange can become much more complicated with that. We're keeping it on a simple level here and dealing only with the microeconomic example. When we get into international trade, then we start to deal with that. And in fact, probably the second toughest, maybe even the toughest exam that I ever gave was in international trade and finance. It was actually a, what I referred to as the mega quiz because it wasn't the same as the final. In international trade and finance, finance they got their final exam the first day of the semester uh, because it was which trade policy is better protectionism or free trade and so they had to bring everything they learned in the class to bear on that but what i gave them was a quiz on currency exchange and what i would present them with was nine pages of currency exchange numbers that were currently i'd get them out of the paper you know that morning or, or a week earlier and then i'd give them a whole series of problems on how to maximize their gain on currency exchange don't worry i know what you're thinking i'm not going to do this to you this is only microeconomics, economics 10 something or other. This is an international trade and finance, which is 4,500. That's as high up as you go at the undergraduate level at Robert Morris. Okay. So that's a little bit more complicated. That's a little bit more. And it was a phenomenal, it was a phenomenal quiz. It was really a lot of fun if you like that kind of thing. Well, and by the time you're studying economics at the 4,500 level, let's face it, you're an economics geek, which is kind of what I am. Um, uh, so we had a lot of fun with it. At this level, we're not going to do that. But it is significant enough, and I can give you problems and questions on the gain or loss based on appreciations and depreciations in currency. And it's real simple to figure it out if you, want, if you remember that it's, there, that it's an inverse relationship. Okay? So if I tell you that $1 equals 10 baht, which is Thailand's currency, we know that that's an inverse relationship. That means that 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 uh, 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 if one dollar equals ten baht, that means that one baht equals point one dollars. Okay, simple enough. Keep the math easy in my head. Uh, and so what we deal with, we're all the way back now. When we deal with this, that's why I say down here at the bottom, we're all the way back. You remember when we talked about demand in in lecture number three? Okay, one of the things we talked about is shifting demand was future expectations of price. We're back to that. Only now we're talking about the demand for currencies. In this case, the alpha and the beta, the euro and the dollar, the right, whatever. Okay, we're now talking about future expectations of a currency's value. And so we're back to the same principle. What did we see way back when in lecture three? Okay, if I expect the price of the uh, of the currency of the commodity to drop in the future i'll stop buying it now wait for the price drop in the future and because i wait now that shifts demand inward and forces the price down so it's a self-fulfilling prophecy now what you have to remember though in this is that you have two countervailing forces at work and I've, I've made this point before, and I'm going to reiterate it. You have the importers and the exporters. These are countervailing forces, meaning they're diametrically opposed. Our importer benefits from an appreciation in currency. Our exporter is hurt by an appreciation in currency. And so while our importer is trying to do things that make the currency appreciate in value, the exporter is at the same time trying to do things that force the currency to depreciate in value. And so these are countervailing forces. And they largely exist at the political level. They're not only at the economic level, they're also at the political level. So you have lobbying groups, okay, that are lobbying Congress, lobbying the Fed, okay, trying to, to get some idea of where this currency value is going to be. That leaves us with the question of what determines the value of a currency. And so currency, like any other commodity, uh, is contingent on the supply of it and the demand for it. And so the question really becomes, well, what determines the supply of currency and what determines the demand for currency? All right. And we've already talked about one of the things that causes the demand for currency. Okay? If a foreign country 
is trying to buy our products, that means demand for our currency is going to go up because they're going to demand our currency so that they can buy our products. That's one. Okay. Now let's go through them. Look, look, look at domestic factors. Okay. Economic growth. Okay. And again, we don't want to de uh, 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 really involve ourselves in the discussion of macroeconomics and business cycles and the growth cycle and recessionary cycle and all that good stuff. But during a period of growth, when industry is expanding, employment is going up, okay, prices will therefore start going up with inflation, there is a greater demand for money. Businesses are expanding. To expand, they may need more capital equipment. They're buying this new capital equipment largely on loans, which is what we talked about in the last lecture, okay, and so the demand for money is going up. So, too... If government spending goes up to trigger growth, the demand for money goes up. You, the, the U.S. government has to buy things the same way you and me do, the same way you and I do. I guess you and I, I is nominative, right? Okay, so the same way you and I do. Uh, all right, so when they go out to buy things, they demand money as well. That creates pressures on increasing the demand for money. That's domestic factors. So economic growth. We had the international factors, and we've talked about them before. Since importers require foreign currencies to import foreign goods, the demand for foreign currency will fluctuate based on the demand for foreign imports. So if the U.S. demands European goods, U.S. importers are going to demand euros. That's going to create upward pressure on the demand for the euro. Now let's go back again to Lecture 3 and see what that's going to do. Okay, if we increase the, and I'm not even going to draw a graphic here because by now this graphic should be burned in your brain. If we keep supply constant and increase the demand for a thing, for either of these reasons, either domestic or international reasons, if we increase the demand for it, it's going to force the price upwards. It's going to have the effect of creating pressure for the currency to appreciate in value. Okay, and that's why I say down here at the end, as any commodity, any increased demand will lead to a price increase, appreciation, and decreased demand will lead to a price reduction, depreciation. What's going to control the supply of currency is ultimately the central bank. Now, the United States is the only country on the planet that does not have a central bank that is con controlled by the national government. One of the things in both survey of economics and in macroeconomics that we want students to understand. And a lot of Americans don't actually know this. They think that the Federal Reserve is the central bank. It's not. It functions like a central bank. I heard somebody describe it as a decentralized central bank, and that's true. But it is not controlled by the national government. The only thing that the executive branch or the national government in general, Congress and the President collectively, can control at the Federal Reserve is the president appoints and then Congress ratifies the appointment of the head of the Federal Reserve, which is currently Janet Yellen, the first woman in history to head the Federal Reserve, uh, and the Board of Governors. The Federal Reserve is divided into 12 districts. Each of those districts has a governor. Okay, so those are appointed as well. But in terms of the day to day operation of the Fed, in terms of the direction the Fed takes, that's up to them. That's a private corporation. Okay, the currency in the United States is entirely controlled. The supply of currency by the is entirely controlled by the Fed. Okay, in other countries, it's controlled by their national bank uh, or their central bank. Okay, so as with any commodity, increased supply will decrease the price, which means depreciated in value, and decreased supply will increase the price, which means to appreciate the value. All right. And that's why we spend a lot of our time, even from a microeconomic position, studying what the Federal Reserve's policies are going to be. Right now, there's some concern. Uh, as of October of 14, when the Fed stopped the tapered off the quantitative easement idea, there's some concern that that's an indication that the Federal Reserve is going to start trying to raise interest rates.
Okay, now Yellen, J Janet Yellen, the head of the Fed, came out and said, no, 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 no. We're going to keep interest rates low for the foreseeable future. Don't go panicking on us. But again, that's something we have to worry about. And that's why I say, see the notes from the micro of finance in Lecture 13. We need to pay very close attention to that. And now we're back to a microeconomic level. On a microeconomic level, as producers of a thing, we have to pay very close attention to this. Because if the Fed announces that interest rates, it's going to undertake things that are going to ultimately cause interest rates to rise up, we better expand our means of production now while interest rates are still low. As individual consumers on a microeconomic level, we know this as well. Okay? If, 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 if we see indications that the Federal Reserve is going to increase interest rates, I better go out and get my mortgage now or try to refinance my mortgage now because in the future, interest rates are going to be higher. I did that. I did that about two months ago, I took great advantage. They actually dropped the the percentage rate on the annual percentage rate on my mortgage by over three points, okay, and reduced the term of the loan to 15 years. Uh, so I, I made a tremendous deal by hitting it when I did. A year from now, that might not be the case. How do we know? Well, now we're dealing with what we talked about in Lecture 4, future expectations of supply. Okay, do I expect supply to go up or down in the future? Well, if I expect supply to go up in the future, that means the price is going to drop and I'll hold off buying until the future. That's now where future expectations of price again. Okay? Now, we want to follow this through. This looks a lot more complicated than it is. Okay? And it's fairly intuitive in terms of the, uh, the, symbol, the symbols that we're using here. Um... In micro, what we looked at way back when, when did we look at this? We looked at this probably in lecture two or lecture three. We looked at the idea of the invisible hand, okay, that there was this automatic correcting mechanism. Uh, no, we looked at it when we talked about market equilibrium, whatever lecture that was. Mar uh, what was that? Lecture, lecture nine, I think. We talked about market equilibrium, okay? Well, when we talked about market equilibrium, we talked about this invisible hand. That there's this invisible hand that forces markets to tend towards clearing, that forces us towards this equilibrium point. Well, the invisible hand exists everywhere in economics, and actually, it's it's kind of tangential to what we want to talk about right here, uh, because we're looking only at really the microeconomic effects uh, of of international trade. But on a macroeconomic level, one of the things we look at, and at the level of international trade, one of the things we we talk about is the fact that this international market mechanism in terms of currency exchange value and in terms of trade, they really didn't know that this existed. It's really kind of interesting. It's fascinating, actually, to watch the evolution of international trade. Okay, really, we can go as far back as the Han Dynasty and the Roman Empire if we want to. But if we just start to look in the 16th century in Europe with the evolution of international trade, they didn't know that this took place. This is why they tied their currency to a hard commodity like gold or silver the spoils or, or the or the or the uh species system all right that no longer exists now we deal with fiat money and one of the reasons it doesn't exist is they discovered this that there is this international mechanism that ultimately forces trade balances deficits and surpluses to balance out over time now let's follow this out and here you see the legend of the script, which is fairly intuitive, okay? Let us start here. Let's suppose that the demand for U.S. exports, following me out so far, the demand for U.S. exports rises. Well, that means that demand for the U.S. dollar is going to go up, right? If the demand for the U.S. dollar goes up, that means the price of the dollar in foreign currency is going to go up. So if the Europeans begin to demand more U.S. more U.S. exports, that means they're going to demand more U.S. dollars. That's going to force the price of the U.S. dollar up in terms of euros. Okay, price of dollar up in terms of foreign currency. Simultaneously, because it is an inverse relationship, the price of the foreign currency in dollars will go down. Now, as a result of the increased price of the dollar in foreign currencies, the price of U.S. exports is going to go up. 
when the price of U.S. exporters goes up, the demand for U.S. exports will drop. Dot, dot, dot. Okay, and then the cycle will, will, will reverse itself. As the demand for U.S. exports drops, the demand for the dollar drops, the price of the dollar drops. When the price of the dollar drops, that means the price of U.S. exports will drop, which means demand for U.S. exports will go up. You see why we have to have to have mastered. We have to understand these basic microeconomic principles that we started out the half master with. Well, simultaneously, while that's happening, when the price of the dollar in foreign currencies goes up, the price of the foreign currency in dollars goes down, which means the price of foreign imports goes down, which means the demand for foreign imports goes up, which means the demand for foreign currency goes up, which means the price of foreign currency in dollars goes up. You see, so over time, it's going to reverse itself. And so the trade balance ultimately and the value of currencies vis-a-vis -vis each other come to resemble, uh, from trigonometry, they come to resemble a sine function. It drops in value. As it drops in value, the demand for it goes up. Okay, as it drops in value, meaning the price goes up, the demand for it goes up as the demand for it goes up. The price goes up as the price goes up. The demand for it goes down and it fluctuates over time. And so over any considerable period of time, trade, the, 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 uh, the appreciation and depreciation of currencies should roughly even out. And as a result, trade should roughly even out. What we notice, however, is that that doesn't always happen in bilateral relationships, for example. Since the early 90s, the United States has run an increasingly whomping trade deficit with the People's Republic of China. And so one of the things we look at in international trade is, why is that the case? Why doesn't it work? Why doesn't this invisible hand work? Well, the main reason for it is that the Chinese government, who controls the People's Bank, which is the central bank of China, intervenes in money markets. They make sure that the value of the Chinese yuan stays roughly the same. They've actually recently, about three years ago, stopped doing that uh, for reasons that we don't need to get into here. But that's the way that the, mar the, the mechanism generally works. And again, this is just to give you a general idea. This is just simply an explanation of what I've kind of already explained. We'll just we'll go through it once again to reiterate it. This is that that invisible market mechanism. This is that that international market mechanism. Okay, now let's just go through this. As the foreign demand for U.S. exports rises, the demand for the dollar rises because foreign importers must first buy dollars to buy the U.S. exports. This leads to an increase in the price of the dollar in foreign currencies. The effect that this has is to increase the price of the, the the effect that it has when you increase the price of the dollar in foreign currencies is to make the price of US exporters higher. We saw that with the example of alpha and beta. That means that foreign importers will have to pay more of their own currency to buy dollars because the price of the dollar has gone up. Okay? Now from the law of demand what we know is that if the price of US exports rise and this isn't a price increase because of what the US exporter has done. The US exporter has not done anything. Their total costs haven't gone up. Nothing's gone up. That's not the reason for the price increase. The reason for the price increase is simply a relative one. It's because of the de the appreciation in the U.S. dollar. Okay? This is why it's a double-edged sword. You know, the exporters start out doing really, really well because demand for their products in foreign markets goes up. But that only means that demand for their products in the future is going to go down. Unless their central banks intervene and increase the supply of money to keep downward pressure on the value of their currency. Okay? The man will fall. This then begins the reverse of the cycle, and this is what we talked about just not just before. Okay? Because the price of the U.S. dollar in foreign currency and the price of foreign currency in dollars are reciprocal, inverses of each other, when the price of the dollar rises, the price of the foreign currency falls. When the price of the foreign currency falls, uh, 
the price of the foreign currency falls, which has the effect of reducing the price of foreign imports. This leads to an increase in demand for foreign imports, which leads to an increase in the demand for foreign currency, which leads to an increase in the price of the foreign currency, which leads to an increase in the price of the foreign imports, and reverses the cycle. And that's why over time, the balance of trade should even out. When it doesn't even out, such as the United States and Japan in the 70s and early 80s, or as the People's Republic of China and the United States now, we have to look for a reason why it's not. Logically, it should. The reason invariably is because of currency intervention by central by governments. Okay, They intervene, and what they ultimately do is when their currency starts to go up in value, they simply lower interest rates, release more money into the system, that drops, that increases the supply of their currency, drops the value of it, so that they can maintain a stable export industry. The United States has actually never done that. But the reason the United States has never actually done that is because the national government of the United States doesn't have control over the supply of money. It's the Federal Reserve that does. And kind of, just kind of as a brief aside into U.S. history, it's not always the case. The U.S. government did, in fact, control the central bank uh, from 1791 to 1811, and again from 1816 till 1832. Uh, but that's for U.S. history class, or for eco U.S. economic history, uh, which I'll be doing over the summer. Now, this is just some, some uh, and this is from 13 January 2012. I haven't updated it. This is the foreign currency exchange ratios, and you can see that they're inverses of each other. This is the foreign currency in U.S. dollars. This is the dollar in foreign currency. This is from January of 2012. In January of 2012, $1 would buy you 0.782 euros. One euro would buy you $1.279. And this fluctuates constantly. This fluctuates on a daily basis. Okay? Uh, and you can find out what, what the currency exchange values are anytime you please. You can do it on your cell phone. You just go, go Google uh, uh, currency exchange rates, and there's any host of sites that track them and that you can see. And there are some that do trend analysis, so you can see the trend of foreign currencies, etc. Uh, and in international trade and finance, we do that. We actually look at, at how that works uh, and, and what the general trends and general patterns are in currency exchange values over time. Here we're just showing it, throwing it out there, so that you can see that it's the inverse relationship. Okay, and so here the the best was the Indian rupee. One dollar would get you 51 Indian rupees, 51 and a half. One rupee would get you 0 0.019 dollars. Uh, oh, actually, the Japanese yen. The Japanese yen was has always been the best. The Japan. This is actually a really uh, uh, appreciated value of the yen. The yen is generally considered about one penny. Uh, is how they set it at when they first created it after the Second World War. But at any rate, okay, it gives you an idea of the currency exchange rate. Now, on to our multinationalists. What we deal with here now, ultimately, is the idea of outsourcing. I'll, and I'll give you an example from a macroeconomic level. When the Clinton administration in the late 90s included Mexico in the North American Free Trade Agreement. Everyone was worried that all of the producers, all U.S. manufacturing is going to rush to Mexico. Now that there's not going to be any trade barriers, they're going to rush to Mexico and produce down there. Well, in point of fact, that didn't happen. It happened with some. Some corporations located some parts of their production process in Mexico, but kept others in the United States. We're going to look at why that's the case. It, it's not always the case that you're just going to outsource to the lower wages. Okay? You have to balance two things. First, and we see them right here. Okay? The decision is between the lower wages in a foreign country. All right? So, for example, like the People's Republic of China. Where they just reported that in what at one of the uh, the the Microsoft offices where they create microchips, they were paying workers sixty five cents an hour, uh, and and everybody raised a stink about it. Okay, that low wage in foreign countries that's going to adjust your variable cost, right? Wages are a variable cost; they fluctuate based on the level of productivity. That will in turn adjust marginal cost. 
And because it adjusts marginal cost, it's going to adjust your profit maximizing level of output. Okay? You have to balance this against the cost of locating the facility in a foreign country. Okay? Which will adjust fixed costs and ultimately be a long run decision. Plus, it will also affect variable costs because if I locate my means of production in China or India or Mexico, I also face the transportation cost of bringing it back home. Now, we could sell the product. We could go over there, okay, locate our means of production there and produce the product there and then sell it in that market. But there's a problem with that, okay? And you see the problem here. Yeah, we could do that, but we have to remember. What originally attracted us to locating our means of production over there is that it's a low wage area. Workers are being paid 90 cents an hour. And so they're not going to be able to afford our product. We're going to have to have a very low price. And so it's not really going to improve our profit maximizing level of output. And here, now here we take a look. This is our classic. By now you, you should be very used to seeing this through the lectures and through the problems we've been presenting in class. Here you have our profit maximizing cost table. Okay, this is our production functioning cost table. Uh, I've truncated a little bit uh, to show only the, the operative parts. And, and you'll remember this. This is uh, when I think we had at this point, I think, yeah, this was our problem from lecture eight on profit max with a fixed cost of $50 a day, a wage of $96 a day, non-labor inputs of $5 per unit, and a price for the product of $13, okay? And so we saw that for $13, our profit maximizing level of production was down here at 207 all right? Simple enough, uh, where, where marginal cost equaled, equaled price, all right? Now, over here, we outsource. We take our means of production and locate it in a foreign country. Well, when we do that, we face a higher fixed cost, okay, because we have to purchase the capital equipment, purchase the means of production in the foreign country. So our fixed cost goes through the roof. This is the amortization of the loan, presumably, that we use to buy the, the, the uh, means of production, the, the plant, okay? As a result, you see how this is going to adjust our profit. So it doesn't always necessarily work out to be the case that outsourcing to a low-wage area is going to be more profitable. It depends on the availability of capital. It depends on the availability of loans. It depends on the terms of those loans. Okay, now we start to get a lot of balls in play. Now we start to really have to consider a number of different factors when we deal with locating in a different country. Now, alternatively, as an alternative to buying capital equipment, locating it in a foreign country to produce over there where the wages are lower, we could just simply pick up our facility here, disassemble it, transport it over to China or India, build it back over there, and then take advantage of the low wage. What's that going to do? Well, it's, we're going to have the same lowering of variable costs because we're dealing with a much lower wage rate. We're going to deal with an increase in fixed costs, okay? And that's what I want you to start thinking about. What I'm trying to get you to do is to think these problems and these questions through from the prism of an economist's mind. What's that going to affect? Well, what it's going to affect is fixed cost. We probably won't face as high a fixed cost as if we bought the capital equipment new and located it over there. We already own the capital equipment. But we're going to face some increase in fixed costs because we're disassembling the plant, transporting it over there, and then reassembling it. That's going to increase the fixed cost. And the reason it's going to be fixed cost and not variable cost is once we've done that, once we've disassembled our productive facility here, transported it over to India or China, and then reproduced it, reassembled it, 
we face that cost. That's a sunken cost. We eat that cost. If we don't produce a thing, if the plant never opens and never produces a thing, we still face that cost. Okay? Uh, so it will be a greatly reduced investment cost. We'll now briefly look at trade policy always with an eye to how it's going to affect us on a microeconomic level. Okay? Free trade policies are policies designed to cultivate international trade. Okay, so anything that reduces trade barriers. One, well, what we're going to go over is the various trade barriers. Anything that reduces those trade barriers fosters and cultivates free trade. Anything that increases those barriers fosters protectionism. And we'll look at who it benefits and who it doesn't benefit on a microeconomic level. First, let's look at tariffs. Tariffs are simple enough. A tax on foreign imports. This raises the cost of foreign products and the cost increases borne by the exporter. Ultimately, that cost increase is transferred to the consumer in the domestic market. Hence, it has the net effect of a price increase. Okay? So, tariffs are, by their very nature, inflationary. They, they, they have a tendency to create upward pressure on prices. And remember that, that if, and so if we increase tariffs, that acts as a retardant to free trade and can be considered protectionism. If we decrease tariffs, that acts as a cultivator of free trade. Okay? The tariff then is going to benefit the domestic producers by keeping out competition. It's going to hurt the importers by reducing the availability of foreign products, and it could potentially hurt exporters because of the possibility of retaliatory tariffs. Okay? In other words, if we tariff their product, they'll probably tariff our product, in which case our exporters will be hurt. The second we go through is quotas. Quotas are a little bit more straightforward. And again, this is, it's beyond our scope to really go over the ultimate effects and the differences between tariffs and quotas. They have roughly the same effect. The only difference is with a tariff, the government gets the money because it's a tax. With quotas, there's no, there's no money that changes hands. You simply limit the number of foreign exports allowed in your market. Okay, in the 1970s, there was a lot of political pressure brought to bear to do this with both Japanese steel and Japanese automobiles. Okay, and they did actually do this with Japanese automobiles for a while. They imposed a quota as to how many Japanese automobiles could come into the United States in any given year. That Those days are gone. Uh, so, and again, if, if we increase the use of quotas, not increase the quota itself, but increase the use of quotas, that acts as a retardant. If we put a quota on the amount of foreign products that come into our domestic market, that acts as a retardant to trade, okay, and therefore has roughly the same effect as, as a tariff. It limits the supply, therefore has a price increasing effect. Well, like a tariff, this is going to benefit our domestic producer, it's going to hurt our importers, and it could hurt our exporters for the same reason, Retali the possibility of retaliatory quotas. Licensing same basic effect. You limit the number of foreign exports by forcing domestic importers to buy licenses to purchase the foreign products. The cost of the license increases the average total cost for importers. And you really have to think about this, okay? Pro importers don't produce anything. And so what is what comprises their average total cost? Well, what comprises their average total cost is everything that it, that, that, that it costs them to import products. Namely, the transportation costs, the warehouses, and the cost of the product itself. Okay? And so if I have to buy a license to import products, that's going to increase my average total cost, which pushes the supply curve upwards, which has an inflationary effect. It, keeps, it supports higher prices. All right? Just like a tariff or a quota. Uh... This will benefit domestic producers by preventing competition by increasing the price of foreign products. This hurts the importers by increasing their cost of importing and reducing profits. Okay? And then it hurts exporters because of the possibility of retaliatory, I said quotas here, you see I didn't even change that, uh, of retaliatory licensing. The most interesting of them is safety regulations. Okay, this is safety regulations, product product specs, anything like that. 
okay? Regu and this ultimately gets the regulatory control by the government, okay? The more regulatory control the government puts and the more restrictions it puts on products, the harder it is for foreigners to sell in the domestic market, okay? This forces foreign exporters to comply with safety standards or with other regulatory conditions of the domestic market, which increases their cost of production, which keeps their supply curve up, which keeps prices up, okay? It benefits the domestic. Anything that limits international trade helps our domestic producers. Anything that limits international trade hurts our importers and may hurt our exporters because of the possibility of retaliation, okay? And so if we increase safety regulations, foreign countries may increase their safety regulations as well. This was used recently in the 1990s, uh, and really, really not the 1990s so much as it began really in 2002. The Europeans went to the World Trade Organization with a series of complaints against the United States based on safety regulations, okay? It was based on genetically created products agricultural products that the united that that the 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 use of steroids and the use of genetic engineering created essentially biohazards when they when they uh broke down in the european environment uh the europeans actually lost their case with the world trade organization on that though the my, my favorite of them are the japanese and we go back to the very beginning of of our of our discussion in this lecture Okay, the Japanese decided, this is in the, really the, the, the mid-90s, the Japanese decided that what they wanted to do was break into the production of skis. For skiing, alpine, right? Well, the problem is when they wanted to break into that market internationally, they were facing foreign competition from principally two competitors the Scandinavian countries in Europe, and the United States, both of whom had developed uh, an economy of scale and faced a very low marginal cost, okay? So in an effort to prevent them from coming into the Japanese market, to give the Japanese ski producers uh, an advantage, a competitive advantage in the Japanese market, they tried to keep out U.S. skis and Scandinavian skis, European skis, from the Japanese market, by making an argument, okay, that was based on safety regulations. They said, oh, well, the problem is this, you see, the, the snow, you see, the snow that falls on Mount Fuji in Japan is fundamentally different from the snow that falls on mountains in Norway and mountains in the United States, you see. And as a result, the skis that are produced in the U.S. and the skis that are produced in Scandinavia are unsafe for Japanese snow, okay? To which the World Trade Organization kind of looked at them and said, really, that's the argument you're going to launch here? That we really believe that? Uh, and so they lost their case. Uh, a suit was brought against them by the United States and the Europeans at the World Trade Organization because it was a violation of the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, which we don't really get into. That's at the international trade level or at the macro level we would talk about that uh and i think if i recall correctly that that's the last of this that, that we've concluded this uh discussion of the microeconomic effects of international trade